Hello, and welcome to the launch of the IEA's new report, World Energy Investment 2023. I'm Jethro Mullen, Chief Editor in the IEA's communications team, and I'm joined here today by IEA Executive Director, Dr. Fatih Birol, and our Chief Energy Economist, Tim Gould, who led the analysis of our new investment report. Uh, and I would note that our new report is free to download and read on our website. Um, so do take a look uh, after, the, after the presentation is over. Um, during today's press webinar, Dr. Birrell will make some opening remarks, and then Mr. Gould will present the key findings of the report. We'll then take questions from journalists. For the journalists taking part in this press webinar, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom. You can do this at any point during the presentation, and we'll also take a two-minute break right after the presentation for you to submit your questions. And with that, I'll hand over to our Executive Director, Dr. Birrell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jethro. And uh, good morning uh, to all of the journalists and the other colleagues and friends following this uh, webinar. Uh, dear colleagues, last weekend uh, I had the opportunity to address the G7 leaders in uh, Hiroshima uh, on energy and climate issues. And in addition to the G7 leaders, I think Japanese government took a very good decision. They have invited uh, the uh, leaders also from uh, India, such as Prime Minister Modi, uh, such as the Lula from uh, Brazil and Joko Widodo from Indonesia and other uh, leaders. In my speech uh, to uh, uh, world leaders, a uh, lot of things uh, I share uh, with them, but the main idea was that a new clean energy economy is emerging and emerging much faster than many realize. I gave some uh, numbers from the uh, IEA analysis in terms of how many gigawatts solar, how much heat pumps, uh, how much uh, nuclear efficiency, hydrogen, and others. Now, today's uh, report we are uh, releasing, World Energy Investment 2023, reinforces the message I share with the world leaders in terms of investment flows. And uh, I am very happy with the results as they are very clear and reinforcing the message I has been sharing uh, with the international audience since almost two years. Let me start with, in my view, a key finding. Five years ago, in, the, in terms of the energy world, it is uh, almost yesterday, five years ago, global energy investments, the total amount of money invested in the all energy sources, five years ago, it was about two trillion US dollars. And out of this two trillion US dollars, one trillion went for fossil fuels, and one trillion for clean energy. So it was one to one. And now, this year, according to our uh, World Energy Investment Report, the amount of investment going to fossil fuels is still around one trillion US dollars. And for clean energy, it increases to 1.7 trillion US dollars. So, five years ago, the ratio between fossil fuels and clean energy was one to one, and uh, this year it is one to 1.7 in favor of clean energy. In my view, in the view of the uh, the colleagues who made this analysis in a perfect way, this is a dramatic shift in the world of energy. Why it is happening? There is a powerful alignment of 
three major factors. Number one, cost. The cost of mature clean energy technologies such as solar, such as wind, is becoming competitive almost everywhere in the world. It's the cost is the one driver. The second driver is policy, government policies. After the global energy crisis started on 24th of February, we have seen the government support for clean energy technologies was much stronger and much faster. Because many governments considered clean energy is a lasting solution to their energy security challenges in Europe, but uh, many other countries as well. And this policy support came on top of the support of uh, the climate change related policies. Therefore, we understood that the government policies really do matter. So policies was the second driver after the cost. The third one is the industrial strategy. I think it is a very clear fact that the future of industry sector is the sector of clean energy technology manufacturing. So many governments around the world are coming with major incentives in order to foster their domestic clean energy technology manufacturing capacity. United States Inflation Reduction Act, Europe uh, is also coming uh, it is green deal industrial plan japan uh, green transformation of japan china already making big steps in that direction india with the uh, uh, production uh, linked investments so this is a big 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 uh, growth coming as an industrial strategy for uh, those who want to have a strong foothold in the next chapter of the industrial sector and where is this investment going? All this investment going, it is mainly going to electricity. When I say electricity, of course, a significant chunk goes to electricity generation, mainly uh, renewables, but also we see a strong growth also in nuclear power. So one is electricity generation. The other one is the grids, storage, and but also we see electric cars and uh, heat pumps are getting a handsome amount of uh, investment uh, from this wave. One shining example, solar. When I look at our numbers, the numbers of um, uh, uh, Mr. Tim Gould and uh, his colleagues, I can easily say Solar is the star of global energy investment landscape. What we see is that each day more than one billion dollar is spent for solar energy in the world. And as such, the amount of investment going to solar in an annual basis is higher now than the amount of investment going in the oil production. So this is, I think, a very impressive uh, uh, way to look at the solar uh, growth and solar investments and the appetite. Now, of course, when we talk about the energy industry, oil and gas industry has a very important uh, share. And uh, when we look at the investment in the oil and gas industry, we get the following picture. Last year, according to our numbers, oil and gas industry revenues reach about four trillion US dollars. Four trillion US dollars, all the oil and gas industry intentional companies, national oil companies, and others. 
when we look at the recent averages, this is two times higher than the, uh, the averages uh, we used to see. So what do the companies uh, do with this uh, uh, four trillion record revenues? So what we see is that, and we look at these numbers, and again, uh, big congratulations for our excellent investment team looking at all the numbers, company by company, uh, sector by sector. And uh, what we find out that more than half of this uh, money for oil and gas industry revenues uh, went to dividends, share buybacks and debt repayment, more than half of it. Less than half went to investments. So this is uh, something uh, I think we all need to uh, highlight in terms of the, if we hear that the companies are not investing here and there because of lack of money, this is not true. It is their uh, choice, which is legitimate. Of course, they have the revenues. They can do whatever they want with their revenues. But the choice, the big uh, part of the choice of what to do with this windfall revenues uh, was the choice of paying back to dividends, uh, uh, share buybacks, and also uh, debt repayment. So uh, we also look. Another aspect when it comes to oil and gas companies' uh, investments in uh, both international and national oil companies, because uh, we were uh, very happy to see that many of the leaders of the oil and gas industry announced that they would like to be part of the solution uh, of our climate change problem, which is, of course, a very welcome uh, news. We would like to see all energy stakeholders to be part of the coalition to address our common challenge of climate change. So therefore, uh, we welcome the willingness and the statements made by the, uh, the leaders of the oil and gas industry. Having said that, when we look at the numbers, as we always do, at the International Energy Agency, we see that the amount of money going to clean energy investments in the total investments of the oil and gas industry is unfortunately less than 5% today. So there is a, a need to uh, calibrate either the numbers to increase the numbers and see higher share of clean energy technologies in the uh, oil and gas industry, or maybe to calibrate the statements. So, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to uh, finish by mentioning one uh, final uh, issue, which is the natural gas uh, markets. Uh, after the uh, Russia's uh, uh, cuts in pipeline gas uh, supply to uh, Europe, we have seen that the policymakers and investors uh, reacted uh, strongly. There is a wave of spending in uh, new supply and also LNG infrastructure. In many important countries, mainly in Europe and uh, Asia, we see a new wave of uh, regasification uh, capacity. And this will be followed in a few years uh, uh, by a major uh, new liquefaction capacity coming in the markets. Our numbers show that between 2025 and 2027, in two, three years of uh, time, we will see an unprecedented 170 BCM of new LNG export capacity is coming into operation. This is, of course, uh, a very important uh, aspect as we deal in Europe and elsewhere the, uh, the absence of Russian 
gas exports. So here, uh, the, uh, of course, the, for the gas industry, for the policymakers, it is not an easy task uh, because we know that the gas business is a long-term uh, business and the key uh, challenge, key dilemma uh, for the investors and policymakers how to reconcile current short-term strong demand uh, uh, pressures and long-term uncertainties in the natural gas uh, uh, demand while we want to keep our uh, uh, climate targets uh, alive. So last two points. Uh, one is that the, I have a, uh, our, as IEA, as an uh, energy expert uh, organization, uh, just to share uh, with all policy makers and the investors uh, a small advice. Please do pay close attention to the trends in clean energy investment that uh, uh, I try to give you some uh, highlights. If this trend continues to grow as we are seeing now, and if it can be broaden more and more to the emerging and uh, developing countries, we will soon start to see a very different energy system, global energy system emerging. And as such, we can keep our 1.5 degrees target alive. And my final point is, I would like to thank sincerely our chief energy economist, Mr. Tim Gould, and his large, able, committed team of experts who made this study for the IEA, for governments, for investors, for anybody who is interested to understand how energy investment is developing around the world, how much money goes where countries, sectors and others. It is a very difficult business, but they put this difficult task in a very nice uh, report. As my colleague uh, uh, Jethro Mellon said, it is freely available in our uh, website. As I told to Mr. Gould, it reads so well it doesn't seem like a, a report on energy. It uh, reads like a poem. So uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, once again uh, our uh, chief energy economist, Mr. Tim Gould, and uh, give the floor to him to elaborate uh, some of the uh, points that I tried to uh, highlight. Mr. Gould. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Executive Director. And it's a great pleasure to talk a little bit more about some of the findings that we've had in this year's World Energy Investment. And as was said already, this is a report where we don't talk about kilowatts or kilowatt hours or barrels of oil. Uh, we're talking about flows of capital into the all aspects of the energy sector, whether that's new energy supply or demand side investments in efficiency and electrification. Um, and we try and think through what that means for um, important policy goals of security and sustainability and emissions reduction and so on, particularly at a time when we've had so many disruptions in the global um, energy sector. And as um, the executive director's words made very clear, this has been an incredibly dynamic period uh, in the investment space. Um, but it hasn't always been so dynamic and it's probably worth casting our minds back to where we were uh, a few years ago. So investment in fossil fuels had been sharply down from the levels earlier in the 2010s. Um, but investment in clean energy wasn't picking up um, even after the conclusion of the Paris Agreement. Now, you were getting more for your money each year because the cost of those technologies was coming down. But we weren't seeing the sort of expansion in capital flows to clean energy um, that we needed. And as a result, we were worried that we were simply not putting enough capital into the energy sector. We weren't investing enough to change 
to get onto a more sustainable track. And in the absence of that pickup in energy transitions, we weren't investing enough to maintain the reliable operation of the system that we had. So we were vocal in warning of the consequences of this sort of indecision of this impasse and, and pointing to the way forward. And the way forward, in our view, was a surge in spending to boost deployment uh, of clean energy technologies and infrastructure. And then came 2020, the disruption caused by the pandemic and then the global um, energy crisis that we're all acutely aware of. And for fossil fuels, that meant an immediate slump uh, and then a recovery. And now we're back around that one trillion dollar in annual investment that uh, the executive director referred to. But the picture for clean energy has been very different. It was more resilient immediately. And then we've seen this sharp uh, pickup and double digit annual growth in recent years. And that's the backdrop to the conclusion that the executive director expressed. Something has shifted. The recovery from the pandemic, the response to the global energy crisis have provided that major boost to clean energy investment, responding to those three factors uh, that were mentioned, costs, policies, industrial strategies. And there's that sharp illustration of some of those investment dynamics here in the, in the comparison that we can make between the money going into upstream oil production and the money going into solar. And solar as is really is the star of the show in our new report. And so it's useful to reflect on just how far uh, we've come in terms of those investment flows. So this is the comparison from 10 years ago uh, between the amounts respected in those two areas. Um, back in 2013, oil costs were high, um, but solar was relatively expensive at that time as well. Since then, the oil and gas industry has become uh, a lot leaner, but solar has transformed even more quickly. And it's not just that investment has tripled, um, but you get well over six times the amount of capacity for, uh, for the investment that goes into the system because of lower costs, because of economies of scale. And we expect this year that more than $1 billion per day will go into solar investments, in, uh, including utility scale, distributed generation, and other technologies. Solar is the center of this dynamic, but it's not the only part of the picture. Um, this is really a broader story about growth in a range of technologies associated with what we might call clean electrification. So that's clean sources of generation, investment in some countries into upgraded, smart, modernized grids, battery storage, uh, and then of course more electrified uses of that. So um, electric vehicles, uh, heat pumps, uh, and so on. And this has been moving fast, uh, and we are expecting, as you see uh, on the slide, continued growth in 2023. So lots of positive aspects, but uh, we shouldn't pretend that everything in the clean energy garden uh, is rosy. There are headwinds, there's policy and price uncertainties in many markets, there are challenges with supply chains, there's issues with permitting uh, that are very much part of the en energy conversation nowadays. Uh, and there are higher borrowing costs, which make life difficult for technologies that require high upfront spending. And those issues are all affecting the pace uh, of deployment. And if I had to highlight one thing that we need to be paying very close attention to, um, which doesn't always get the attention that it deserves, and that's this question of grids, this question of electricity networks. So in a world where you can build a new utility scale renewable project in two years, but a new grid project typically, typically takes at least double that. It's clear that your network planning needs to be running ahead of the curve in order to avoid being a constraint on growth. And that is often not the case. So if we cannot expand, expand grid infrastructure in a timely way, um, this can be an important limiting factor for renewable investment in the future. And it's a big preoccupation here at the IEA and you'll be hearing more from us uh, on this topic. Very interesting dynamics also if we look at the geographical allocation of that clean energy investment. And what you're looking at here is where have we seen increases um, between 2019 and today? Um, very impressive growth, but it's really concentrated in a handful of major economies. China, as I think we're all aware, is a clean energy powerhouse leading investment trends in many areas. 
Uh, but new policies are accelerating deployment elsewhere, notably in the European Union um, and in the United States. And there are positive stories in, in other countries. India's solar deployment, renewables are picking up in, in Brazil. There's also some major investments planned and underway in, in parts of the Middle East. But overall, we do have quite an imbalanced picture when we look at the geographical spread of that clean energy investment. Almost all the growth has come from advanced economies and from China. And we really need to see that takeoff in clean energy investment elsewhere. There's an awful lot more to be done there, including by the international community, to facilitate that growth in clean energy investments. And we're shortly going to be coming out with new analysis on how to finance an acceleration in clean energy projects in emerging and developing economies at something we're doing jointly with the International uh, Finance Corporation, and that'll be out in a few weeks' time. Let's broaden this out. Let's look at the whole picture um, and across all of the major categories that we track. Um, and the first element of that is the investment that's going into different parts of uh, fuel supply. And as was mentioned by the executive director, the oil and gas industry saw record revenues during the energy crisis in 2022. And some of that is going back into what you might call traditional elements of supply. But it's striking that even with those record revenues, only a handful of oil companies or oil and gas companies are investing more in the upstream than they did prior to the COVID pandemic. So these are mainly large national oil companies um, in the Middle East. And by contrast, you'll see that investments in coal supply um, have been growing uh, relatively strongly and are already well above 2019 uh, levels. And it's quite difficult to see, but from a very low base, um, there's a very dynamic picture emerging around low emissions fuels. There's a lot of policy support coming through for investments in low emissions hydrogen, uh, for CCUS, for biogases, for biofuels. Um, and I expect that we'll see that pick up much more strongly in the years to come as well. We've already talked a lot about power, um, but you see immediately the contrast between the power investment side and the fuel supply investment side. So in power, already 90% of investment is going into low emissions technologies, so renewables uh, and nuclear. Investment in new fossil fuel fire generation has been flat or declining, although there was one warning sign in 2022 uh, when we had a relatively large amount of new coal-fired capacity approved. The vast majority of that uh, was in China. And then we have the demand side investments. We've talked about electrification, that surge in EV sales and a really strong pickup in heat pump sales as well. Uh, the picture for efficiency is, is more mixed and we really need to be paying attention to that area as well uh, because we need huge improvements in efficiency to get on track for our, our climate goals. I'd like to say a few words now about this question of what happened to that large influx of revenue that accrued to the oil and gas industry in 2022. Um, because that was one of the big questions that we needed to look at when we were doing this analysis. Um, where would it go? Would it go back into the energy sector? Would it go somewhere else? And as the executive director explained, and when we look at the cash spending by the oil and gas industry in 2022, 22, um, more than half went to dividends, share buybacks, um, debt repayment, um, and then the, the things that were put back into energy investment, the vast majority of that uh, went uh, into, in a sense, traditional areas uh, of oil and gas. Um, and there, I think, as the executive director mentioned, we, we think that there is an opportunity there for with these revenues for the industry to move ahead with the, not just with the transformation of its own um, profile but also to support the overall transformation of the energy system. One other major factor that we needed to address with this analysis was you know, what are the implications of that shortfall in Russian gas deliveries uh, to Europe um, following uh, Russia's cuts after the invasion of Ukraine. And this has had implications across the board. It gave additional impetus to clean energy uh, deployment in, in Europe, but it also spurred new investments in gas supply and, and infrastructure. 
And in a way, we're seeing two waves of deployment coming through. The first wave, which we're already seeing today, is on the import side. So investments in new regasification infrastructure, and that's visible in Europe, but there's also a lot of uh, activity there in other parts of the world, uh, in Asia, notably in China. Um, but we've also seen how the crisis prompted additional investment in export capacity. That's the most expensive part of the gas value chain. And around 60 billion cubic meters worth of annual export capacity has been given the green light uh, since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that's nearly double the rate of new approvals uh, on average over the last decade. And that takes time to come to market, but it does mean that if you take that together with other projects that had already been approved, we do have that extraordinary um, surge of new um, liquefaction capacity uh, coming onto operation between 2025 and 2027, and that's going to have huge implications then uh, for markets. And I think the dilemma here is how, in a long-term industry like the gas industry, do you invest in ways that deals with uh, a really near-term need for additional gas, um, but also um, uncertainty over the long-term outlook? I'd like to say a few words also about um, investment in supply chains, because that's a major issue for policymakers, for investors, and a major issue also uh, for the IEA. Uh, and we wanted to take the example here of batteries, because where we have record sales of EVs, strong investment in battery, battery storage for power, and a push from policymakers to scale up domestic supply chains. You know, we have that, oh, if you look at the manufacturing plans, um, there's a prospect uh, of a large new wave of lithium iron battery manufacturing projects around the world. Uh, and for the moment, China is the main player at every stage of global battery manufacturing, with the exception of the mining of critical minerals. And the announced manu manufacturing plants, as you see on the screen, uh, would somewhat erode this position. Um, but one of the really critical questions for battery manufacturers is also about the inputs that they need the battery metals, um, the cobalt, the nickel, um, copper, and so on, that are so important to a more electrified um, system. Um, lithium, as well, is, is, is an incredibly important part of that, uh, that picture. So investment in new mining operations for non-ferrous metals is picking up. Um, we also see new exploration. Uh, amongst a quite a diverse group of, of countries, so Canada, Australia, Brazil, resource-rich countries in, in Africa. But moving from exploration to new production um, can take more than 10 years. So there remain concerns that critical mineral investment will become a constraining factor for clean technology manufacturing and deployment. And that's why it's very much on the agenda here at IEA. And that's why we are convening a, a major clean energy and critical mineral summit at ministerial level uh, in September of this year. Finally, what does this all mean for the future? What does it tell us about the direction in which uh, we are heading? Um, if clean energy investment keeps growing to 2030, as it has done over the last two years, then overall spending on clean electrification in particular uh, would get us beyond the needs of an announced pledges scenario. So the APS is one where we we give governments the benefit of the doubt, and all of those national climate and emissions reduction targets are met in time and in full. And some technologies, notably solar, are growing at rates that uh, would match those required in the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, so the NZD on the screen for 2030. But maintaining those high, high rates of growth is tough, and as I've mentioned, some elements of the picture, including grids, efficiency spending, low emissions fuels, uh, risk lagging behind. And then there's that big open question about accelerating deployment in emerging uh, and developing economies. Um, but what happens on the left-hand side of the screen will then determine what the needs are for on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, so how clean energy spending evolves will determine then the way that clean electricity starts to erode some of the markets on which fossil fuel suppliers uh, have relied. Uh, and that then leads to those differences in future requirements for fossil fuels across um, different scenarios. So there are risks there, um, but if we get that 
um, surge in, in clean energy spending on the left hand side of the screen, then you can see that the requirement for fossil fuel investment would be considerably lower by 2030 um, than it is uh, today. So our overall message, we are in a significantly better place than we were a few years ago. We've broken that logjam in investment that uh, I described at the start of this presentation. There's still a very long way to go, but there are finally um, some encouraging signs for us all uh, to work with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we now have time to take some questions from journalists, so we invite the journalists in attendance to send your questions through the Q&A function of the Zoom if you haven't done so already. And please mention your media outlets uh, along with your question. Um, and so we're just going to take a two minute break to give you a chance to enter your questions and we'll be right back. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, thank you very much to all the journalists for the questions. Um, we've got some very good ones and we're going to try and get through as many of them as we can um, uh, in the time we have left. Uh, starting with um, Stanley Reid from the New York Times. Um, he says a lot of oil and gas leaders, especially in OPEC Plus, say there is an ongoing shortage of investment uh, that could lead to future shortages. Uh, what is your view? Um, and an additional question is uh, whether tax is, is, in, is included in uh, 
uh, your calculations of oil and gas revenues. Um, linked to that, we have a question from Claire Pennington, uh, who I believe is from ICIS, um, uh, asking, has Europe invested too much in LNG terminals um, and extended global reliance on gas? How could this impact meeting climate goals? Um, so uh, a, a recurring question here, I think that, 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 that Tim will take is, you know, too much investment in oil and gas or too little? Um, and we also have one um, about the G7 um, for Dr. Birrell, um, just asking what your key takeaways were from your conversations uh, with leaders um, with, from around the world, G7 and beyond in Japan. Um, so maybe I'll pass the first question to Tim. Uh, well, sorry, questions, um, and then and then to Dr. Birrell. So thank you very much indeed for the questions. Um, our analysis shows that oil and gas investment has been rising uh, for the last uh, few years after that slump in in 2020. Um, the adequacy of that investment really depends on your view about which which world we're in. Where are we heading? And I think we've illustrated during this, um, during this presentation and discussion that that really depends on how quickly we start building up alternative ways of meeting the demand that is currently met um, by fossil fuels. And so the flows of clean energy deployment, particularly in fast growing uh, emerging economies, become then a crucial indicator of where we are. Um, but the overall benchmark, if we look at the volume of investment going into new oil and gas supply, then it's broadly aligned with the 2030 needs of our stated policy scenario. So that's a scenario based on today's policy settings. Um, I would though underline that today's policy settings are not set in stone and that steps is not in the same place every year. So investing for, for that scenario, um, that can, well, by the time you arrive there, it might not be where you think it is. Uh, and so that's why we encourage all participants, all investors, to keep a very close eye on some of those clean investment dynamics. And the other thing I think to have in mind when it comes to oil and gas investment is, you know, that relationship between investment and costs, because some of the increase that we are uh, envisaging for this year, roughly half of the increase that we're envisaging this year is to accommodate cost inflation for different parts of, uh, of the oil services uh, and supplies uh, for the industry. A more specific question about whether tax is included in the, some of those revenue calculations. So the, the net income calculation, that four trillion number, that is just revenue minus costs. So it doesn't include tax. However, that, that, that um, slide showing the cash flow and the allocation of cash flow, um, that is um, post tax. On the question about whether Europe has invested too much in LNG infrastructure. Um, well, we've had a very dramatic reduction in Russian pipeline deliveries. Um, and those need to, at least in part, be replaced because even as Europe accelerates its efforts to build up alternative ways of meeting those, uh, those demands, um, there is a need for, for, at least in the short term, for uh, alternative sources of supply. And the ability to get those in from alternative pipeline routes is, is of course, uh, limited in the short term. Uh, and so a lot of investment has gone into regasification facilities. I think the thing to have in mind when you, when, you, when you talk about whether that really locks in consumption for the future is a lot of that investment has gone into floating regasification facilities, which are much easier to, of course, redeploy to other parts of the world. Uh, and the other very important aspect there is if you're investing in onshore facilities, um, to what extent can they then be used for, to be make them more compatible with a changing energy system? So can some of those facilities be used one day also for handling um, low emissions uh, gases? So you could import LNG but then turn it into hydrogen or you could potentially use some of those facilities to import um, uh, green ammonia or, or, or other hydrogen rich fuels. So that's the uh, way I would uh, respond to that question. Uh, uh, I think I replied to the uh, G7 question. Uh, 
at the G7 last uh, weekend uh, in Hiroshima, I think, as I mentioned, the Japanese government followed the, uh, in my view, a very sound approach. And in addition to the G7 leaders, uh, Prime Minister Kishida invited the leaders of uh, India, Prime Minister Modi, Lula of uh, uh, Brazil, and Joko Widodo of Indonesia, Australia, Korea, and uh, several other countries. Why I'm saying this is it was a very diverse group of leaders from a political perspective, from an economic perspective, economic development level uh, perspective, and also from a, a, a different uh, uh, continents of the world. Now, if I have to pick up one key takeaway is that I was very surprised, positively surprised, that such a diverse group of world leaders all agree on the clean energy is the future of the world. So they were all agree on that and they all made their commitments from their country's perspective. They all uh, express their expectation that the world goes in a clean energy direction. So if I have to pick up one uh, takeaway, it is this. And of course, as the head of the IEA, I should mention uh, that the, uh, we were, and I was uh, flattered uh, to see that in the, the world leaders there in Hiroshima, but also after their uh, communique, recognized the IES uh, global leadership role and gave additional responsibilities and mandates to IEA to lead the global clean energy transition. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Tim and Dr. Birol, for those answers. Um, we've got a few more questions we're going to try and squeeze in. Um, a couple of questions on coal, um, one from Ronald Kim at Argus um, saying we saw coal producers posting large profits last year owing to elevated coal prices, but coal prices, been po sorry, uh, coal prices have been falling this year towards the break even point uh, of small medium scale producers in some regions while inflation has pushed up production costs. Um, how significant would this be on the investment in coal supply? And then uh, Rafiq Latta from Energy Intelligence. Uh, on coal says your report shows strong gains in coal investment. Do you see this being sustained? And if yes, uh, has there been any analysis of what this means for climate targets? Um, I think uh, Tim will take that question. Um, a couple of questions on uh, ratios and, 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 and numbers uh, uh, from Junior Isles at the Energy Industry Times. Um, he's talking about the uh, 1 to 1.7 ratio between investment in fossil fuels and investment in clean energy. Um, so what does that ratio need to change to by 2030 if the world is to keep uh, the 1.5 uh, um, goal within reach, the 1.5 degree uh, goal? And then um, also from Junior Isles, I get the impression that the IEA would like to see oil and gas companies increase uh, clean investment from the 5% average uh, currently. Um, what kind of percentage do you think they should, could or should be making? Uh, and then we have a question um, related to, uh, um, to oil again, I think. Um, uh, what is your response to the comments earlier this week um, by the Saudi energy minister uh, about the IEA's projection, projections and analysis? Um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Birrell will probably take that one. So maybe Tim first for coal and... Um, and uh, the ratios. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for those questions. And the first question on coal, um, indeed, we have seen an increase in coal supply investments over the last couple of years. Um, that's been rising at around 10% around per year. 90% of the investments in coal supply are in the Asia Pacific region, um, with China and India being the key players uh, in that space. And then when we think about the profitability of those supply investments, you know, we really need to, to quickly move across to talk about demand. And 
what will happen then? Um, in the near term, that's obviously related to broader economic factors, the rate of overall economic growth, but it is also related to how quickly we can scale up some of the alternative ways, particularly of meeting um, um, electricity uh, demand. And just to give you a sense of the compatibility of those levels or current levels of spending with a 1.5 degree scenario, um, current spending on coal supply is around six times higher than we have in our net zero emissions by 2050 scenario um, in, in 2030. And then I think there were two questions from Junior Isles about uh, sort of different aspects of the ratios that we had. So we have this 1 to 1.7 ratio. So one at the moment, there's one for every dollar of spending on fossil fuels, there's $1.70 going into clean energy. What would that look like in a net zero emissions by 2050 scenario? So by 2030, that ratio has changed quite dramatically in, in a 1.5 degree scenario. So for every dollar going into fossil fuels, there would be nine dollars going into different aspects of, of clean energy. Um, so uh, and we've, uh, there's more information on that also in, the, in, our, in our World Energy Outlook publication. And then um, we had the impression that the IA would like to see oil and gas companies increasing clean energy investment from above, from that 5% average. What kind of percentage do you think they could or should be making? Um, well, there's clearly a variation already across different kinds of oil and gas companies. Um, some are considerably lower than that 5%. Um, some, particularly um, some of the big uh, European companies, have already well into uh, double digits and they have quite strong ambitions. So it is possible for that already today to be considerably higher uh, than 5%. What you sometimes hear from oil and gas companies is that they don't see the projects out there that generate the required uh, returns for them uh, to invest. Um, but I think in that context, you need to be also aware that policy is creating a lot more investment opportunities, uh, particularly in areas like CCUS or in low emissions hydrogen or in biofuels that seem to be a good match for the capabilities and expertise of the oil and gas industry. So there is an opportunity there to scale that up um, also from a policy perspective. But in terms of what percentages would be compatible with uh, uh, our net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. I would encourage you also to await some analysis that we're going to be releasing a little bit later this year in advance of the COP28 in Dubai, looking specifically at the role of the oil and gas industry in net zero transitions. And we'll go into that in a lot more detail then. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, and so just time for one last question, uh, the one I mentioned briefly before. Um, uh, for Dr. Birrell, which is, what is your response to the comments earlier this week by the Saudi Energy Minister uh, about the IEA's projections and analysis, uh, Dr. Birrell? Uh, thank you, Jethro. Yes, uh, I read the comments of uh, Mr. Minister, but uh, I wouldn't like to uh, comment on those. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Birrell. Um, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentations uh, uh, and for questions from the journalists. Um, if any journalists don't have, uh, have questions that didn't get answered during the Q&A that you'd like to follow up on, please do reach out to the press office and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so thank you all uh, for taking part, for your questions, for uh, listening in from around the world. Um, and a reminder that the full World Energy Investment 2023 report is available for free on our website. Um, so do please take a look. Uh, and that's all. Thank you and goodbye.